Hello, everyone. How's the, how's the sound? Is it good? It's been just such a great pleasure to be here in Aspen. It's my first time in Aspen, and uh, it's just a splendid, splendid place, and the Writers' Foundation, such generous and gracious hosts. It's been a, a real treat. And uh, I've, I've been to many events on behalf of my writers and a few as a writer. And I have to say, this is just top notch in every way. So thank you so much for having me and having us. Um, it doesn't seem like Aspen is a place that you would ever want to leave. <laughs> um, but I am going to invite you to leave briefly and travel with me to Paris 150 years ago. And then we'll come back and I'll talk a little bit about why I've asked us to take such a crazy journey. Um, to give you a little background, the unruly passions of Eugenie R. is set during France's Second Empire. Uh, it's set during the years of 1860 to 1871, which was a period of great expansion in France, economic and creative effort. We, of course, know this era from the great Impressionist painters, the birth of photography, novels like Flaubert's Madame Bovary, which was censored in its day, uh, although now we consider it a masterpiece because Emma, of course, had an affair and <laughs> that was uh, kind of uh, persona non grata at that point. Of course, the rebuilding of Paris by uh, Haussmann that architecturally gave us the city that we know and love today um, it's the creative work of the period that really speaks to us and that we identify. Um, but it was also a very dramatic time in other ways um, that are a little bit less known to us and certainly completely unknown to me when I started this, this book. It was um, politically a very dramatic, very hot time. And the society was in a state of great polarization uh, that was one cause of its uh, if, a real falling apart. It was um, quite polarized in terms of rich and poor, uh, the haves and have-nots, the workers and the aristocrats, and um, it ended in, in quite a disaster. In 1870, the emperor, Napoleon III, declared war on his neighbor, Germany. This was the Franco-Prussian War, for any of you who remember back to history class. Um, it led to the siege of Paris, when Paris was surrounded by the Prussian army over a long, cold winter. And then when France, who had started the war in the first place, uh, surrendered, the country broke into a civil war. It culminated in the Paris Commune period when the standing government, such as it was, was sent packing and a group of very idealistic and very angry Parisians briefly took control of the capital. So the novel opens during that period and when our heroine Eugenie is leaving the city. She's not fleeing, though. She, the war has opened up certain um, important things for her to do. So this is just from the very opening of the novel. Paris, May 1871. This train, the Aurore, is a night train headed south, southwest. A drape is secured across the window and behind it is a deep, quiet blackness. The compartment is a box with brass locks, rough napped tapestry and some silk fringe fitted with a lamp. Here, one can remove one's gloves, take the knife from the boot, perhaps find again the textures of things or one's own thoughts. Between one place and another, at last, neither here nor there, it is a respite, a still rush of night air. Behind us, the roar of a city on the brink of burning. An hour ago, we stopped for dinner just outside the capital at a cafe counter in a station where the French tricolor flag still flew, and it was strange to see it in place of the commune's red, the defiant banners and colorful rags that had cropped up across the capital like spring poppies after a long winter. We had a hasty meal, and then the entire body of passengers, Prussian officers included, climbed a low rise to see what we could. Whether on the horizon a dull red pyre lit the evening sky. 
Someone had a telescope, and silently, among strangers, we passed it from hand to hand. From this distance, no sign. The Prussians stood silent. They must certainly be marveling at a Paris again under siege on the heels of what came before. If Paris burns, it will be the second time in my life that I have left fires behind. No sound but shuffling footsteps as we head back to the train. Because I was a girl and am now a woman, I have dreamed some nights. Dreams do their best to reset the soul, but it is heavy work. Dawn or noon or whenever it is, one pushes back the bed linens, brings on the pressing needs of the day. Those who do not dream or do not remember are able with confidence to say, I think and so I am, like the philosophers. I might have once said, I love and so I am, and then love was lost to me along with a thousand other things. How does a woman learn to doubt herself? When does it happen and why? Is it in her blood and bones from birth? Does her mother nurse her on it? Or is the alphabet learned later than syllable by syllable, a secret language between mind and heart, or an argument between lovers? Sometimes it seems that she cannot answer a single question about her life. Why has it been thus? How did it come to be what it is? And how does she begin to speak when all that has been understood has made any story too difficult to tell, when what is truly desired is so far from possibility, when she has made herself cynical and before that only guessed at what she knew? And then, two. She has spent the days and weeks and years in giving way. When, at what hidden moment, was the choice made, and what, in the end, did it yield? I want to wake after the night's rocking journey south to be dazzled by old white stone, the sunlight of late spring on the countryside where I was born, a relaxation of vision, a widening, finally, of the slits my eyes have become. Years pass, and one does not remember what might lie beyond the Paris walls. If the train window's dark reflection could be lifted like a shade, would there be old walls, spreading oaks, the arches and spires of villages, or are we yet too near the city, its slaughtering yards and rubble heaps, places where the night soil is dumped and the capital's detritus is hauled to be picked over by ravens and urchins, where the old women drag themselves, one-time boulevard girls rattling like stray stones, the grand cocotte who didn't safeguard her hoard when she might have, and now sews sandbags for the commune's street barricades or serves the forts. All of a woman's appetites become fiercer as she drives herself to ruin. I have seen it a thousand times. I'm in first class with the Prussians, but the lock is secure and I have no business with them. How I arrived here in this compartment of blood, doubt, and collusion, all tacked together with elegant railway fittings, and the black brocade of my going away coat is a question even I who lived it must ask. The aurores whistle howls. We stop, then slowly pull out of an unlit station. Another train, another time. A girl, myself, a stranger to me now, one who took it upon herself to dare her destiny. I close my eyes against the roaring. This prologue ends with a, a prayer. Um, Cleanse us of the horrible darknesses of our minds, which is a line from the Aurora Concergains, a 15th century mystical text whose title means the rising dawn. And what I feel like I was trying to do with this novel is to enact that prayer, to, to make good on it, and to explore that question, how does a woman learn to doubt herself? 
That was my question about my own life when I started writing. And my search for answers took me back and back and back like onion layers to, to issues that 150 years later than this time I wrote about have not yet been resolved and I think some solutions too that remain for us to understand today. You know, I had questions like, why are women so uncertain about what makes us happy, what we need from others, what we can ask from the world, or how do any of us proceed when we start out in life with the expectation that things are going to be just fine and then the bottom drops out, when we lose trust in the basic institutions of society, when entities that encourage us to trust them turn out to be exploitive. These are questions we know a lot about these days in our own era. So this novel was, was kind of an experiment in imagining an imagination and how to alter consciousness, to change the way this woman thinks about and experiences her life and the world. Her journey was, um, was immensely uh, fun and interesting to, to work on because it had art and absinthe and friends and many lovers, luxury and starvation and, you know, they ate the animals in the zoo during the siege of Paris and all kinds of colorful details. But what it's really about for me is making the shift in attitude away from the exploitive and exploited instrumental mode in which we feel acted upon by the world, victimized by others, betrayed, disempowered, all of which this young woman, Eugenie, feels very profoundly and for very good reasons. Um, and to move from that toward a broader view, a life in which she can actually experience her own agency, her ability to work with the creative powers of the world, which are always there. One thing I learned in writing this book is that when things fall apart, something else always arises to take its place. And that life seems to be something like writing. You can't just stop in the middle of the story. So that is a great comfort of fiction, both reading it and, and writing it. So for me, the book has been a kind of a bridge. It was an active, living process. And I say this because I think sometimes people, myself included, think that they want to write a novel in order to write a novel. But um, for me, in order to write this novel, and especially to finish, not to mention publish this novel, I needed to reteach myself how to live in about every way. And it went against the grain of, many of what, much of what I'd been taught by my family and school and society, received ideas. So it's been a journey. It's been a wonderful one. I'm delighted to be sharing some of it here. Um, and I'll stop because this is actually the perfect segue to this gorgeous, ingenious, funny, heart-wrenching book written by the amazing Karen Joy Fowler. You know, on the surface, our two novels couldn't be more different. Our, our, our trajectory as writers couldn't be more different, but I think that, that these books have a lot in common. You know, we are all completely beside ourselves, and I, for one, am very proud to be beside Karen Joy Fowler tonight. So, thank you. I will um, start by echoing sort of where Carol ended that... Um, Certainly, at least my experience reading her novel was that it spoke very deeply and very profoundly to me. And um, whatever differences there may be uh, on the surface, there is um, something there as well that, that I recognized when I read Carol's book as uh, things I had been waiting for someone to say. I am going to read to you the prologue to my book and the first page of chapter one and then um, talk just for a little bit about it. The um, mic is, seems to me like it's working. Is it okay? Thank you. Those who know me now will be surprised to learn that I was a great talker as a child. 
We have a home movie taken when I was two years old. The old-fashioned kind with no soundtrack. And by now the colors have bled out. A white sky, my red sneakers, a ghostly pink. But you can still see how much I used to talk. I'm doing a bit of landscaping, picking up one stone at a time from our gravel driveway, carrying it to a large tin wash tub, dropping it in and going back for the next. I'm working hard, but showily. I widen my eyes like a silent film star. I hold up a clear piece of quartz to be admired, put it in my mouth, stuff it into one cheek. My mother appears and removes it. She steps back then, out of the frame, but I'm speaking emphatically now. You can see this in my gestures, and she returns, drops the stone into the tub. The whole thing lasts about five minutes, and I never stop talking. A few years later, Mom read us that old fairy tale in which one sister, the older, speaks in toads and snakes, and the other, the younger, in flowers and jewels. And this is the image it conjured for me, this scene from this movie, where my mother puts her hand into my mouth and pulls out a diamond. I was toe-headed back then, prettier as a child than I've turned out. That's a sadly autobiographical moment in the vase. <laughs> and dolled up for the camera. My flyaway bangs are pasted down with water and held on one side by a rhinestone barrette shaped like a bow. Whenever I turn my head, the barrette blinks in the sunlight. My little hand sweeps over my tub of rocks. All this I could be saying. All this will be yours someday. Or something else entirely. The point of the movie isn't the words themselves. What my parents valued was their extravagant abundance, their inexhaustible flow. Still, there were occasions on which I had to be stopped. When you think of two things to say, pick your favorite and only say that, my mother suggested once, <laughs> as a tip to polite social behavior, and the rule was later modified to one in three. <laughs> my father would come to my bedroom door each night to wish me happy dreams, and I would speak without taking a breath, trying desperately to keep him in my room with only my voice. I would see his hand on the doorknob, the door beginning to swing shut. I have something to say, I'd tell him, and the door would stop midway. Start in the middle then, he'd answer. <laughs> A shadow with the hall light behind him and tired in the evenings, the way grown-ups are. The light would reflect in my bedroom window like a star you could wish on. Skip the beginning, start in the middle. So this is the first page of chapter one. So the middle of my story comes in the winter of 1996. By then, we'd long since dwindled to the family that old home movie foreshadowed. Me, my mother, and unseen but evident behind the camera, my father. In 1996, 10 years had passed since I'd last seen my brother, 17 since my sister disappeared. The middle of my story is all about their absence, Though if I hadn't told you that, you might not have known. By 1996, whole days went by in which I hardly thought of either one. 1996, leap year, year of the fire rat. President Clinton had just been reelected. It would all end in tears. Kabul had fallen to the Taliban. The siege of Sarajevo had ended. Charles had recently divorced Diana. Hailbop came swinging into our sky. <coughs> Claims of a Saturn-like object in the comet's wake first surfaced that November. Dolly the clone sheep and Deep Blue, the chess-playing computer program, were superstars. There was evidence of life on Mars. The Saturn-like object in Hailbop's tail was maybe an alien spaceship. In May of 97, 39 people would kill themselves as a prerequisite to climbing aboard. Against this backdrop, how ordinary I look. Thank you. Well, um, 
as Mo said, um, there is a, a supposed to be a great surprise in the book. The book is written so that on page 77, <laughs> you learn a bit of information that you did not have before, which casts what you've been reading and what you will read in a different sort of relief. And I have been struggling ever since I went on the road with the book with how to deal with the fact that there's a secret. And um, I had, I feel, good reasons for organizing the book this way. I still believe in this organization, but um, I did not really stop to think of the difficulties I was creating for the marketing department, who now <laughs> had to try to persuade you to buy a book without being able to tell you what the book was about. <laughs> and for the reviewers who wish to review the book without telling you what the book was about, <laughs> um, all of which I have some modest sympathy for, but most painfully for me, who um, then went on the road with a book that I had boxed myself in on, and um, I would often ask at the beginning of a reading, if I told you there was a great secret in the book, how many of you would know what I was talking about? Imagining that at some point most people would. This is, after all, a select group of people who had come to hear me, um, and that has not happened, so. Um, but as luck would have it, this is, today is the pub date on my paperback, and for reasons that bewilder me, my publisher has decided to put the secret on the back cover, so <laughs> there is really little reason to pretend that it's a secret any longer. Um, <laughs> although, if you read the book, which I hope you will, I hope you will pretend this conversation never took place. <laughs> I am of an age where I am quite capable of not remembering um, <laughs> that I have been told what a book was about. Um, so I'm, I'm trusting you all to do the same thing. So I'm going to tell you very qu quickly and um, how I got the idea for the book, and then um, Carol and I will begin our discussion. And in telling you how I got the idea for the book, I am going to have to tell you what the idea for the book was. I got the idea for the book on the Millennial New Year, so that's how long I've been thinking about this book, although I wrote two books in the interim, so I cannot claim to have been working on it all that time. My daughter um, had taken me to celebrate the New Year to Bloomington, Indiana, which is where I grew up. I left Bloomington when I was 11 and have lived in California ever since. My children are native Californians. I'm married to a native Californian. I sometimes feel cross about this. And, um, and apparently have made Bloomington, Indiana sound like a kind of Oz where we would all be happy if we could only live there instead of the hellhole of Palo Alto, California where <laughs> I initially moved um, and Santa Cruz where I now am. And so my daughter had never seen it, Bloomington, Indiana and she took me back. My dad was a professor at Indiana University he was a behavioral psychologist. He ran rats through mazes. And we had gone to see Dad's lab. He died before my daughter was born, so she never did meet him. Um, and he, too, was kind of a storied figure. And as part of this, I told her about another psychologist at Indiana University who, um, who did a very famous experiment in the 1930s in which he attempted to raise his infant son alongside a young chimpanzee and to try to uh, standardize the ways they were brought up and to see what the difference would be in what their capabilities were if you gave a chimp a completely human upbringing. And I was telling my daughter this story and she said to me, wow, what would it be like to be the kid in that experiment? You should write that book. So that is what I try, have tried to do. I, um, we're going to be talking about the imagination. This is probably a theme I will return to. I don't have good ideas, but I know them when I hear them. Um, so I am often very dependent on someone else having the good idea. It could be you. It could be tonight in the Q&A. Not to put any pressure on you, but really do try to step your game up. <laughs> I 
asked to be switched waters. Did we switch? Do you care? I didn't switch. I have been drinking. Did she drink out of this glass? <laughs> have you been wondering if I was going to drink out of that glass? <laughs> So, um, as Mo said, and how is the mic check now? Are we still good? Um, both, uh, both Carol and I have written books that required a great deal of research. And for a number of reasons, I think, um, reviewers and interviewers like to talk to you about your research and, um, and what parts are true. And, um, and I guess I have gotten tired of that. So. Um, I, I was hoping tonight, and Carol has agreed that we would talk, try to talk instead about a much harder topic, which is the parts that we made up. But if I could start by asking you something, is that all right? Go for it. Um, well, I will yeah. start sort of moving from the research into the book to ask you, um, you're writing a, a, about a historical period, You've done enormous amounts of research. Do you feel that constrains your imagination more than it supports your imagination or the opposite? And, and can you talk about, about um, how the research supports you imagining the bits that you cannot research? Well, because, because I started out my professional life as a book editor, um, and I knew that it was really a no-no for a book editor to be a writer. It's just kind of a line you don't cross. It's, it's like the chef, um, when the chef goes to the banquet, you know, he knows who spits in the soup. So people in the kitchen don't actually want the chef to be doing that. Um, so as a result, I just took a long time as much time as I possibly could give myself to do the research so I wouldn't have to admit to anyone that I was writing a book. Um, and it had an interesting effect of, um, I think I went through a lot of different phases with it, but ultimately I, I had done so much reading into the period uh, that, and fiction, nonfiction, um, monographs, court records, I went to textile museums and looked at women's umbrellas, and that when I, as I was writing, I realized that I was really writing about a world that I knew very, very well. And that started to be incredibly fun. Um, even when I was writing about hard stuff like the war, I would have all of these tactile objects in my, in my mind, and I could come back, as I think you do in life, to, to a postage stamp or, or an envelope or a letter or how the ink was. And that's, of course, historical novelists love that kind of thing. But I felt so at home in that world that, that my confidence level was, um, was really boosted by, by it. Now, I was told, I was doing a panel, um, and I was told by um, a very eminent editor, I was on the panel as a writer, and I was told by one of my peer colleagues, um, scolded, in fact, that this is not the way to write contemporary historical fiction. This is not what audiences want. This is not the way to do it. You need to basically write it at the level of a Wikipedia research project. And <laughs> I was just kind of um, gobsmacked by this comment because the, the joy of doing that and to be able to write freely in this way was so so profound for me that it, it really made me into a writer. So um, I, I don't know. I think that, that it was a multifaceted journey. Now can I turn the same question yes. back to you? Um, I, I think that research functions in, in a lot of different ways for me. Um, but one of them, which I sort of illustrated with the page that I read from chapter one is that I feel the world is so peculiar that, uh, you know, when I, when I tell you that people killed themselves because they thought they, it would allow them to um, climb aboard an alien spaceship, I am creating a world in which my imagination has a lot of space. There is nothing I can make up that's going to be too preposterous 
in this world. And, um, and so in that very specific way, I think, uh, I, I also have written historical novels. Um, this one takes place in partly the 1970s and partly the 1990s and partly current day. And I am old enough to refuse to see the 1970s as a historical novel. This is, uh, we do, though. The young people really do. <laughs> this, this is all contemporary. Um, but I have written historical novels, and I, and I always think to myself, the kind of history that I am attracted to and the kind that I'm likely to use um, is history as it would have been reported in the National Enquirer. I'm always... <laughs> I'm always looking for the oddity, and um, and again, I think in a way, it it just gives me permission to make up whatever I wish to make up, and and. Um. So, what was the most fun part of the imaginative part of your journey of writing this? The m most fun part was that character, um, and this is, a again, I think. For me, in many ways, the, the perfect research result that I can have is that I can find out enough to be interested, but I can't find out so much that I don't have questions. And, and that I write, I write through my puzzlements and my perplexities because somebody in an actual historical moment has done something that makes no sense to me. And I'm trying to understand what, how that might have happened or what that person might have been. So in the case of we are all completely beside ourselves, when um, my daughter gave me that idea, I knew that I was going to have to do a lot of research about chimpanzees. I thought, I do not know very much about chimpanzees. That, that will have to change. Um, <laughs> and there was a lot of information, the, um, the experiment of simultaneously raising a child and a chimpanzee was, as far as I know, never repeated. But a lot of people home raised chimps, and a lot of times there were children in the house. And I could find a great deal of information about the chimps, but I could find nothing about the children who grew up in those houses. Um, I knew, um, and this is me pretending a kind of expertise, that the, the Wikipedia um, comment it would be more pertinent to. I knew that there's something in the brain involving mirror neurons and the fact that the one of the closest creatures to you when you were an infant and your brain was very plastic, was a chimp, would actually have chemical and, and geographical architectural effects on your brain. But I had no idea what those would look like. I had to make those up. And that was a lot of fun. And partly a lot of fun because there was nobody to tell me I did it wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask you kind of a hard question now. Well, first I think you need to ask, <laughs> if you need to answer that same question. What was the oh, most fun Oh, what was the you? most fun part? Well, you, you know, I, I, I think that partly I had to derive my fun from... Um, from being able to, to trick myself into letting go of my control. Um, and, you know, the editorial part of my personality, which does dominate at times, wants to be in control. Um, I'm also a Capricorn, you know, so that part is a kind of stubborn, willful being. And I could feel that I was trying to write out of that mode sometimes, but then, um, I managed, and I think that the research played into this sometimes because I, I was able to um, uh, somehow, I don't know how, it's a magical process to allow what was on the other side to reach through the page or the computer screen or whatever I happen to be, to be writing on and kind of take me by the hand and say, you're not, you're not in control anymore. And one of them was when... Um, you know, Eugenie goes to Paris and she's abandoned and betrayed by this man that she's deeply, deeply in love with and he just dumps her in Paris and leaves her on her own and she has no money and she comes from the countryside and has no idea what to do. And I was really angry with this man, Stefan, 
and I was intending to keep him off the page for the entire novel. I wanted the whole novel to be hers, and that he was just going to be entirely a background figure of no importance. And I, I will just never forget the, the day in, in which I, I, he kind of appeared and, and demanded to have his own, his own story told, and not in a small way. He wanted his own chapter, and he wanted to set things to rights and and he wanted and to, to really be treated with certain generosity yes, as well. Yes, certain generosity and respect and he had a story to tell and I had absolutely no idea what it was going to be. Um, so I just had to, um, I don't know, the image comes to mind of, you know, those giant ear trumpets that old women had in the 19th century? I was kind of like, okay, putting an ear trumpet to the wall and <laughs> trying to hear his voice. and. Eugenie's voice was always so strong for me that getting her to step aside was really something. And, uh, but I, um, I, it was enormously fun. And then when I realized that he had been in India, I was like, oh my goodness, he's been in India? <laughs> so, so um, uh, you know, there was something, to the, there was such a rush, you know, about, about that whole thing. And, um, well, I was going to ask you next if there was anything in the book that had really surprised you, but it sounds like you just answered that question, unless, yeah. unless there's another <laughs> moment of surprise. Where Honestly, it surprised me that I, I managed to finish it. I mean, I was working <laughs> on it for a really, really long time. It was really hard for me to write, and I, when I realized I had to, at the end of my first draft, I had to... I had avoided the war, that was one thing I did, because I thought it was just too complicated for me to get into the Franco-Prussian War. So I wrote the entire first draft and submitted it to publishers in New York. Um, without having done that, I just managed to kind of sidestep it. So then I, you know, the whole, I went through the whole process of, you know, rejections and all that kind of stuff that I'd been doing to writers myself for 25 years. So that was a journey. And, um, and when I went back to it, I thought, how did you think you could get away without writing about the war? You have to learn about it, and you have to, you have to go. So I, um, I did that, and I didn't think I could do it. You know, I, I really didn't think I could do it. So the fact that I did, and it's now a book, is just a huge surprise to me. It still is, even though it's been out for a while. Um, but what I wanted to ask you, Karen, was. You know, you describe the process in kind of a, a cerebral, kind of a, a mental way even. But what I felt reading your book was such strong emotions about, I mean, when I found out that Fern was a chimp and that that was the sister, I just, you know, I did kind of know because I knew Karen and I heard people talking about this, but I managed to suspend all of my knowledge. So all I ask. All yeah, I it's ask. It's totally possible. It hit me like a ton of bricks. You know, it was very emotional for me. And I still feel a lot of emotion about both Fern and Rosemary. And I wonder if you think that that emotional quality that we as novelists need to be bringing to the page, is that about the imagination? Um, as as always, uh, uh, which is why we always end up talking about the parts we did not make up. It's just so much easier. Um, my impulse is to answer that question by talking to you about my personal history, which um, is, uh, I've already told you that my father was a behavioral psychologist. I began arguing with him over the question of whether animals could think when I was about six years old. And so, um, a thing that I, I sometimes think about with a certain chagrin that I think another six-year-old might have realized that this was actually her father's area of expertise and <laughs> <laughs> that right. perhaps it was, you know, a moment to learn something, but I was not ever that child. Um, and so, you know, in some very deep way, um, this is part of my relationship with my father. We had this argument up until his death. Um, this is my last word. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I've won, I think. <laughs> uh, really, there's, he's been thoroughly routed in this book. So, um, 
So somehow, and, but it is also that my childhood um, works in my writing in a, in a way that feels magical to me, that it, it is a source for me of that emotional um, imagination, uh, of, of imagery, that when I talk about it, it you know, when people ask me, well, you know, which parts of this story or that story actually happened to you, and I try to answer that question, I feel the whole subject, myself, the work, becoming less magical by the moment. There's something about my childhood that I cannot articulate, but that is a steady source for me of Bloomingtonian magic. Seasons and fireflies and you know all of the things that um, the freedom that I had as a child. So it's it's hard for me to know where the line in this case between my uh -huh. autobiography uh -huh. and my imagination uh -huh. actually is. And it seems like not a fruitful for me question to think about too much because as I said, it begins my whole this whole source of whatever begins to flatten out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the problem with talking about with talking about it. Well, I think maybe we should ask the audience if you guys would like to ask some questions. There's a gentleman there. Thank you. This is a, a question about imagination. Both of your writing styles are quite different. And um, I, I've found that if you don't have a good story, no matter how interesting your words are, you, you lose your audience. However, um, I think that linguistics, the cerebral activity, is very important. Can I, maybe there's a good question for you, Carol, as an editor slash writer. How do you balance that out, and is it necessary to balance it out? You mean language ability and beautiful writing and style versus the forward movement of a story arc? Okay, I'm just trying to clarify what, <laughs> um, what terrain we're into here. Um, you know, I think it's very subjective, actually. I mean, I, I try to, to, to read. I try to be a good reader, the ideal reader for the material that I'm reading. I know right away if I'm not that reader. Um, you know, there are many, many books that have wide readerships and they're on the bestseller list and everything else that, you know, I would put down after a chapter. And I've chosen books either for language or for story or for some alchemical um, combination um, that have been very successful, but others don't read. So I, I that is really why I, I'm passionate about diversity in publishing, which is a whole other panel discussion we could. There need to be enough books for all readers to choose and to also grow and to be able to challenge ourselves because sometimes we really just want that great forward moving storyline like, you know, to carry us off at the end of a hard day or a summer at the beach or a vacation. We just don't want to work that hard. Um, and other times we need a kind of an immersion in a mood. Uh, and that storyline is just too harsh or too demanding, in a, you know, it's too um, insistent or something. I found that with myself as a reader. I, I don't know. So I, um, I just think there has to be a lot of, a lot of writing and a lot of books published and, and to allow us to grow in our tastes over time and move back and forth. I, I love this, this saying, suspension of belief, and I'd like to hear a little more about that. Well, that I think <coughs> in, in my reading experience, um, refers to my willingness to follow a writer wherever the writer is going to take me and you know hopefully not hit a point where we part ways and 
the writer has gone somewhere I, I am not willing to follow. Um, uh, I think, you know, one of the reasons this topic appealed to me is that as a reader, what I think I want more than anything, more than story, more than language, both of which are things I want desperately, but mostly I think I want to see how somebody else's mind works. I want to be inside the, the writer's head, seeing how they are putting pieces together and what they think is beautiful and what they think um, I need to hear. And because of that, I think I am willing to, um, I am willing to be a generous reader, that I, I am not easily dissuaded and I am not easily removed from a book. But, um, but I have had, as a writer, some experience that uh, along those lines that I find peculiar. I wrote a short story called The Faithful Companion at 40. In this short story, Tonto has turned 40 and the Lone Ranger has forgotten. Um, so Tonto is kind of waiting for a phone call that is not coming. And, um, and the book involves um, t time travel and, and uh, a kind of displacement uh, and, and living uh, a, in a world which is kind of like a, you know, old television set. It's about an inch thick. Um, and there are talking buffaloes in it. And I have had many people say to me, talking buffaloes? <laughs> and I think, but you were all right with the rest of it? Why? <laughs> Why is talking buffaloes the line in the sand over which you will not cross? Um, uh, this is a question for Carol. Um, you mentioned that you didn't believe that you could finish your book, and you also mentioned that your book was about how a woman um, begins to doubt herself, and I, I'd like to hear more about that. How did you? So would I. Why do you? Keep, why do you? <laughs> what, what made you keep writing if you didn't believe that you could finish? Well, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, <laughs> you know, doubt is such a fascinating subject, and that's you know that it's it's actually something that you can't think about too hard, or you or you begin to doubt your ability to do absolutely anything. Doubt is like an infection. It's like an infectious disease. And I, I think that it's, you know, I, I always wanted to write, but I was a blocked writer for about 20 years. So when I look at someone like Karen and see this amazing output, I'm just absolutely in awe. Um, so I really, um, it took me a very long time to understand what writing could be for me, what it was for me, what it was in terms of my identity. And every time I felt um, any confidence about it, I would um, somehow unconsciously uh, kind of wipe it. And, and then I had to start over again. And it was, though, um, really, honestly, it was the sheer joy of of writing and of even when I had to throw out, I was talking a little bit earlier today, I threw out so much. I threw out many drafts of this, but I remember I was renting a farmhouse um, in Massachusetts and it was snowy and I had been living in the city and I had no idea what I was doing and I had to make wood fires and all kinds of stuff that you guys are <laughs> totally familiar with, but for me it was like, oh my God. So I had this manuscript laid out on the farmhouse table. It was a long table and I thought, the entire manuscript, you know, sucks basically. It's horrible, and and um, and I was very depressed. I took a walk and I cried on a rock and I thought I will never be a writer, and I'll never finish this book. Forget about being a writer. That was an abstraction. Anyway, I came back, and my eye fell on one line. Bert had a lover in Ash. That's Eugenie's mother. Eugenie's mother had an affair. And I thought, oh, Bert had a lover in Ash. Now that is interesting. 
A lot of this other stuff that I wrote isn't interesting, but that is interesting. And you know, my hope returned. And even though the rest of it went into the bin, I took that, and it's not, it, it's in the book, but it's not the main subject, it's not the main plot line, but it, something about the writing itself, I think, has to rekindle your interest, and from that interest, it grows, you know? It's like nurturing a little plant. You know, you can't plant it in nutrient-starved soil and expect it to grow. And I had to turn myself from someone who was really a new, creatively starved to someone who knew how to put the nutrients back in and, and cultivate that little plant and really have faith in it. Um, and I, I still have crises of faith, you know, um, and, and I've begun to recognize it in myself and feel a little bit, you know, sort of gently humorous toward it, like, here we go again, you don't believe this can happen. Um, you know, images of the natural world come up a lot when I try to think about the creative process, like, um, you know, really helping something to nurture and grow, and something that's been, you know, kind of wounded and traumatized. I mean, when you talk about your family background, something that I have not talked about at all, really, in connection with this book, but both of my parents were very, very creative people. My mother was an artist, my father was a musician, and they both stopped themselves. Uh, they gave up on their creative work because they thought this, this is the real world, we have to be practical, we have to have jobs, we have to raise the kids, we've got to put food on the table, and these luxurious things are not for us. And so that was something I had to undo in myself, that to actually say that actually creativity and the creative process, which for me is writing, is for everyone. It is. It doesn't matter whether you publish that book or not. Um, the creative process is a gift that we all get. I really passionately believe in that. So. Karen, so I've been reading your short stories, which I love, and recently finished uh, What I Didn't See, and was wondering, are there any themes in that that kind of play out in the new book, which I admit I have not yet read, and just kind of in a global story, in writing both short stories and novels, is there anything that you then pick up, maybe ideas or themes in the short stories, and, it, and get to use them in your novels? Well, certainly that particular story um, is about a small group in the 1920s that goes to um, Africa hunting gorillas. So um, there are pr primates. Um, <laughs> in, uh, I'm obviously very interested in primates. And uh, although my friend um, Terry Bisson did an interview with me and sort of said, what's with all the apes in your books? And, and I was able to say, you do know that we're apes, right? So <laughs> your books are filled with apes too, Terry. Um, but I, you know, I think um, my short stories are generally um, more fantastical than my novels are and, and more on the edge of fantasy or science um, or science fiction and that that one that you know one of the things I'm I'm continually fascinated with is what our position in the natural world as humans is are are we natural or are we you know in some way um, the antithesis of, of nature um, and you know, one of the great things about these more fantastical literatures is that they allow you to do kind of thought experiments about where the line between human and machine is and where the line between human and other animal is. And I am, I am interested in boundaries. I am interested in clashes of culture. I am interested in when one thing becomes another thing. Oh. So... Um, all of that, I would say, is probably in all of my work. It's just in that particular story and in this particular book, it was more primate-focused than, than usual. I think, I cannot think, oh, no, no, well, 
I, I tell a lie. My second novel has a gorilla in it as well. <laughs> a bowling gorilla. If, um, it, it's, it's about women's baseball, so where the bowling gorilla came from is one of those mysteries of the imagination that I, I have to say cannot, <laughs> cannot track back. I thought, I will write a book about women's baseball, and suddenly there's a gorilla in it. Yeah. Hi, I, this is a question for both of you. It's about titles. Very often there are titles that get left in the bin, and I'm wondering how you both came upon these titles and what perhaps other titles existed before the final title. Well, my original title um, was The Logic of Passion. And that is the title um, that's, well, the, it is from a quote um, by Stendhal, and that phrase is, the logic of passion is insistent. And when you talk about the doubt question, it actually goes to that, because that is a line that I kept coming back to and back to and back to. The logic of passion is insistent, that it is going to find its way out. There is, there is something going on here that needs to run its course. And it, it, I like the juxtaposition of those two words. And I loved the title, The Logic of Passion, even though every editorial bone in my body told me that it was not a good title. It is two abstractions linked together. People don't like that. You have to have people. And um, so we really killed ourselves to try to fit, come up with the title. Um, and I. I like this title, but I don't, I'm not as in love with it. And, and um, some readers have said to me, you know, I was, it, the, the title, I was expecting a different kind of, I was expecting kind of a different book, you know, that maybe they were expecting a bodice ripper or something, because of the word unruly. To me, the word unruly has a, a multiplicity of meanings that goes beyond the, the sort of, you know, kind of average meaning of it, that there is something deeply unruly about this character. Um, and, and that's how I can reconcile myself to it. But in my heart of hearts, the book is, will always be the logic of passion. And <laughs> I find um, that I either have the title immediately or I do not have the title. And uh, I have signed many contracts for books where the title, you know, is lost in the mists of history. I've Sarah Canary was the Dragon Gate when I signed the contract for it. Um, the Sweetheart Season was the Sweet Wheat Sweethearts when I signed the contract for it. And my editor said, I'll let you have that title if you can say it five times quickly with that. <laughs> um, so this was a book that I didn't have a title on for a, a long time. And I had a, I had a quote from Bob Dylan that in my head sort of substituted for the title, again, in some mystical way, because I have no idea why this quote meant much in terms of the book at all, and, and did not survive into the final book. But every draft I had had this, started with this quote, which was, um, Mr. Jiggs and Miss Lucy, they jumped in a lake. I'm not that eager to make a mistake. Um, and somehow that, kept me going through many titleless <laughs> months. Isn't it funny how they can, those phrases can have that conjuring power? Yeah. 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 So that's exactly what it had, a conjuring yeah. power. Yeah. And when I did come up with the title, we are all completely beside ourselves, I loved it. It does a thing that I like titles to do, I think, which it, I, I think, means one thing when you start the book and means something different when you finish the book. Um, but I did not for a second believe I would be allowed to keep it. I thought, I will turn the book in and they will say, right, let's, let's talk about this title. <coughs> but he ever did. I'm still waiting for that conversation. <laughs> I think you're safe now that the paperback <laughs> is out. You know, sometimes we do have to have those discussions in publishing, those horrible discussions of, you know, that title on the hardcover really just didn't work out. We have to change it for the paperback. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> wow. I've never seen that. So you're, it is, you're really safe. You know, it's very long, so it's hard to write out every time you want to talk about the book. We, we refer to it in family as Whackbo. 
with this whack bow. <laughs> If we have, do we have time for one more question? I, I know this lady back here has been having her hand up. Thank you so much. It means the world to me as a writer to hear the humility and the uncertainty and that you're not experts in the things you start or end up writing about that kind of come magically your way. So thank you for sharing that. And I have a bittersweet compliment. So sometimes as a writer, I read writers who inspire me and think, I can do this. It makes me think I can really do this. And then I sometimes read your work, and I think I will never write as good as this. So I just really, or well, <laughs> I just wanted to put that out there and say that that was my experience. And it, it, it just seems to shoot to the stars. And I'm sitting here on the planet thinking, I don't think I can get to the stars the way you all do. So thank you so much for sort of making it impossible <laughs> to think I'll get there, <laughs> but making me think that people do that and that they can use beautiful language and beautiful stories and weave in the surprises. And I appreciate, Carol, you sharing about this character sort of forcing you to write because that you didn't want to write about him because that is the magic, you know, that I sometimes feel. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I will, can I just say in return that I have also, however, had on many occasions the experience when I talk about how I came to writing, how I tried to learn to write, who I was before I wrote, um, and had many, have had many people say to me, I did not think I could do it until I heard, um, until I heard you, which I, um, you know, could mean Apparently any idiot is capable <laughs> of this. I am, I am reassured. Um, but I think in general it is, um, is meant um, generously and, and to me is more, you seem like a kind of ordinary person, which I think I am quite an ordinary person and that um, ordinary people can write books too, as it turns out, as yeah. luck would have it. Yeah. Time and revision are really powerful. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of what I had to do was step away, come back, you know, see it fresh. It's, it, it, time is a remarkable yes. force to be able to work with in writing, and I feel like I'm just beginning to learn about it, too. There's more to and be discovered. And pretty much everything that I like in my own books is something I put in quite late in the process. Oh, that's um, interesting. I spend a lot of time writing really dreadful stuff. Uh, that I, <laughs> so hard to believe when you see the final product, right? Well, I think we're gonna um, wrap it up and I just, uh, maybe if we can give Carol and, and Karen a nice round of applause. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It was really lovely, and I thank you share, for sharing so much. Um, Karen and Carol will be out in the lobby and uh, invite you to buy their wonderful books, and uh, they'll sign them for you. So thanks for being here tonight. Thank you so much.